The first to notice were those who never stopped thinking, the anxious minds. They were the first to realize the smartphone had begun to react to things that were never even spoken. You remember a person you haven't seen in 10 years, and the next day their face appears in your social media recommendations. You think about a specific fruit you haven't eaten in a while, and suddenly recipes for it flood your feed. You didn't Google it. You didn't say it out loud. You didn't write it down. You only thought it. And this is where the fun begins. Of course, everyone decided it's just a coincidence. The algorithms are so smart. Yes, the algorithms are smart. For years, they couldn't remember that I'm not interested in fashion for men over 50, but now they suddenly understood that I was thinking about the C? The scariest part is that this is happening to everyone, but no one wants to talk about it lest they seem paranoid. And the paranoids, by the way, as usual, turned out to be right. First, we were afraid the microphone was listening, then that the camera was watching. Now it's clear that was just the childhood of total surveillance. We have now entered its adult stage. Part one, the ghosts in the machine. Why is no one surprised that it's your headphones that first guess which track you want to play? That YouTube serves you a video about guilt after you've spent the whole evening thinking you're living your life wrong? That it suggests sad playlists when you're sad, even though you haven't shown it in a word or an action? On an official level, everything is explained by neural networks, machine learning, behavioral analysis, context, and other scientific sounding words. But there's a feeling that someone is playing hide and seek with us, that we don't know where the analysis ends and the mind reading begins. Technologically, it may be explainable, but emotionally, it feels wrong. This isn't how progress works. It's not supposed to be so intuitive that it predicts something that hasn't even become an intention yet. And the most surprising thing is that few are worried. People have simply accepted it. So what if my phone now senses I'm thinking about divorce? As long as the battery holds a charge, as long as the Wi-Fi doesn't drop while it's guessing what kind of person I really am. So what's the solution? Disconnect? Go ahead, try. Leave your phone, headphones, all your devices at home. Go for a walk. When you come back, your feed will already be filled with articles on walking alone, anxiety in the metropolis, and where to escape to if you're tired of people. We are living in an era where the renunciation of thought is the only way to hide, where the truest personal boundary is our inner speech, and it is already under threat but no one is talking about it because it's scary to think about. And that means it's already too late. Part two, the camouflage of thought and the lost generation. Let's imagine what this could turn into, because let's be honest, we can't give up our smartphones anymore. We are fused with them. So if disconnecting is impossible, the only option left is camouflage. How do you camouflage a thought? It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But soon, this will become the new body language. If you want to hide something, don't say it. If you want to truly hide it, don't think it directly. Soon, we will have two layers of thought, the outer layer, which the smartphone sees, and the inner layer, which remains only yours but you won't be able to remember all the time which is which. This means a schism will begin. The thought will be edited in the moment, even before you have time to become aware of it. You will no longer tell yourself, I am angry. You will tell yourself, I cannot be angry now. It will give me a way. I'd better think that I'm tired. And what will become of people who can no longer think honestly about themselves? Now, think about the children, those who are born into this reality where thoughts are not your own, where you grow up under a scanner, not under the care of your parents. We, at least, 
remember what it was like to sit in the kitchen and think about something of our own without a self-destruction playlist being pushed into our headphones at that very moment. Now imagine a child. They don't even know how to formulate thoughts yet. They are born spontaneously, vividly, but the smartphone is already catching up, already guessing which videos to show, which toys to advertise, which emotions to reinforce. It turns out that even their own head is not at their disposal. The child hasn't even said they're scared, but they're already being served a cartoon on how to cope with anxiety. They barely begin to feel bored and TikTok has already loaded up. They don't know how to be bored, how to live through a thought, how to keep it to themselves because they don't have to. The phone will prompt everything. And if a thought doesn't have time to mature, can a true personality emerge? If any inner movement is immediately caught, processed, and turned into content or a commodity, then where is the moment when a child is left alone with themselves? The answer, nowhere. Before, to understand who you were, you had to be bored, to wander, to stare at the ceiling. Now all of that is intercepted. An emotion is just born and there's already a theme song for it. A pang of pain inside and there's already a video where a vlogger has the exact same pain. It seems like empathy, but it's not real closeness. It's a mirror made so that you feel nothing in the silence. And without silence, there is no self. Here is the formula with which they will grow up. I exist when I am reacted to. Part three, the quiet revolution. What is already happening? All right, let's stop fantasizing and look at what is already happening. Because the most interesting part is that I'm not making any of this up. Everything has already been said. Everything has already been published. Only no one paid attention. In 2023 at MIT, a headline read, we have learned to read inner speech using neural networks. Inner speech, no longer inner. This is not science fiction. This is a real existing study. A device reads neurosignals before the moment of vocalization. That is, when you haven't even moved your lips, you're just thinking a phrase and the program already recognizes it. Convenient? For paralyzed people, it's a breakthrough. But let's think. If the technology can already do this in a lab, what's stopping it from being integrated into a mass market device? Corporations are already openly funding the development of brain device interfaces. The goal is for a person to be able to type 100 words a minute mentally, no keyboard, just thinking the text. Others are developing smart lenses that will track the movement of your eyes and pupils augmented reality that sees what you're looking at before you've chosen anything. This is the reading of micro intentions. You haven't even realized you want coffee, but the lens has already calculated the movement of your eyes and is ready to order. You thought this was fiction? No, it's a patent. Now let's put it all together. A device that tracks your pulse, your breathing, your eye movements, a neural network that predicts your emotions, headphones that hear the vibrations of your skull bones, and big data that knows how you behaved in all previous cases. And we still think we are in control? Why has so few people noticed? Because we don't read the news, we scroll through it. And those who do read get tired. The flow of information is such that if today scientists learn to read minds, and tomorrow someone released a phone case with ears, the case with ears wins. The noise is stronger than the meaning. No one is hiding anything from us. Everything has been said, but quietly between the lines in the stream of noise. If you haven't learned to extract these signals, you simply won't notice that your thoughts have ceased to be yours. Conclusion, the final frontier. So what do we do with this once you've understood that thought no longer belongs only to you? It's too late to wrap yourself in foil. It's too late to delete yourself from the system. Then what? There is no universal recipe. Everyone must consciously decide for themselves 
whether they are ready to give their thoughts to the system. The system wants to control our thoughts, for now, without violence, just through recommendations, through content tailored to our mood. It is learning to recognize and suppress thought crimes. If people start to be afraid to think, everything else can no longer be controlled. It won't be necessary. The global artificial intelligence has already studied our texts, our images, and our language. The last frontier remains, our thought forms. If it learns to understand not what we say, but what we think, it will have absolute power, not over an abstract society, over each of us individually, at the level of intention. And that is a completely different conversation.